Hello, Dave. Hello. How are you doing? Oh, very well. It's uh, the season's turning here. It's sunny but cold. I'm so thankful that you joined me on such a short notice. I know that you are a busy man with so many things going around. Uh, is is happy. I've always said that. Uh, you know, one of my plans for retirement is to is to live in Pakistan. If the political situation calms down a little bit, I think I'd have a great quality of life there as a retired gentleman. Well, trust me, if if the Americans are uh, planning to live their retired life in Pakistan, that would be a great news for us. <laughs> well, you know, it. it uh, I, I've often felt. Uh, you know, if I could uh, uh, spend my summers in Murray and, uh, you know, my winters in Islamabad, uh, skiing and squat, uh, you know, and uh, honestly, uh, we can't get good mangoes in this country. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it, it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. Yeah, it would be wonderful. And there is a famous saying, we always crack a political joke here in Pakistan that there are three, uh, three A's uh, which play the vital role in Pakistan's every field of life. A for Allah, A for Army, and A for America. <laughs> well, you know, America's influence is, is, is really overestimated uh, uh, all around the world, but particularly in Pakistan. And, and uh, um, sometimes when I try to explain this to Americans, they say, uh, they're paranoid, and and I have to tell them. I say no. Uh, it's 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 really a compliment. You know, they really do think that uh, we are capable of doing just about everything, and um, you know, usually it's expressed in bad terms. But what it you know, uh, there's two things to look at. The first is it what it means is that they have supreme confidence in our ability to solve problems, whether we do it for the right reasons or not. Beside it, and the second thing is when you look at any uh, elite, uh, you know, international uh, famous, you know, senior officers in the Pakistan Army or whatever, they all have children or brothers in Los Angeles or Houston. I mean, um, um, people who have the ability to do vote with their feet. So. Um, there, there may not be affection all the time, but there's definitely respect. And uh, honestly, that's a better basis, I think, for countries to work with each other. On. That's right. That's right. I would like to invite you, Dave, to introduce yourself to our viewers. Okay. I, I know that you are a very uh, a famous security analyst, expert, <laughs> but still, we need to know a little background. Oh, you're very background, And then we'll come to the topic. You're very kind. Uh, so I'm I'm a, a professor at the National Defense University. I work at the Near East South Asia Center for Security Studies um, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Pentagon for uh, about 15 years. Um, I worked uh, a variety of issues. I worked peacekeeping. I worked Pakistan affairs. I worked uh, NATO operations. Um, I was the liaison to the Department of Homeland Security. My last job, I was the director of the Arabian Peninsula, um, uh, which was a very rewarding job and led to my position here. I mostly work on Arabian Peninsula issues, but I also work on issues like special warfare, unconventional warfare, technological developments, mostly all, almost all security related. Um, I, uh, uh, I started off in civilian government. I worked in the White House in the Clinton administration on narcotics. Uh, for four years. That was a real honor. Um, originally, I was uh, an army officer. I uh, uh, went to uh, high school in Los Angeles, California, which is kind of like Islamabad. It's remarkably like Islamabad. If you look around uh, the hills in Los Angeles, the hills in Islamabad, you can't tell the difference. Um, and then I um, uh, went to the military academy in New York. Uh, I uh, graduated. I served uh, in uh, Monterey, California, uh, in Egypt, in the peacekeeping forces, uh, in um, Italy, uh, and deployed all over the region in the Mediterranean in Italy, uh, in the parachute regiment there. Um, I left the active army, went into the reserve army, um, in mostly in special warfare community, and served uh, in uh, Bosnia, uh, in combat in Afghanistan, Pakistan, of course, um, in, uh, and then in the Special Operations Command Staff, the Joint Staff, uh, and the Army Staff in the History Office. Um, 
my academic background, I, as I said, I went to the military academy, which in the United States is a four-year degree granting. It's, it's actually one of the premier educational institutions in America. Uh, and then I uh, did all my graduate education at the um, University of London, the School of Oriental and African Studies and King's College London. Um, and th then, of course, I went through a series of army schools as well. So the equivalent of Kiti Azam University, I went to the Army War College uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, our Command and General Staff College, which is in Kansas. Uh, I've been at the Near East Center for 10 years. I write and produce a lot. Um, I do a lot of media, um, quite frankly, because it's part of my center's mission to explain the United States to people. We, we really have processes that are not quite rational. Um, and I'm a fellow at several uh, institutions, uh, the Arab Gulf States Institute, the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, uh, Reconnaissance Research, and the Gulf International Forum. Oh, is that good? Excellent to have you. Okay, that's, that's an honor. The perfect person to talk about the post-election uh, U.S. strategies in Afghanistan and the region. Oh, it's the an honor. Country. It's an honor. It's an honor. Yeah. So how you how you see uh, the past era, immediate past era of Trump administration in Afghanistan yeah. and the region? Well, Afghanistan is not a focus for the Trump administration. Um, when you look at uh, what the Trump administration did, uh, it viewed when President Trump ran for office, he said, look, the United States is um, tangled up in uh, so-called endless wars that uh, don't serve our natural interests, where we've uh, you, we may have gone in for one purpose in the issue of Afghanistan. It was to um, you know, suppress Al Qaeda, keep them from attacking the United States. And then the mission expanded and we got ourselves drawn into conflicts that are, you know, not our not our problems, not our fights um, that just drag on and on and on. And so um, Iraq was seen as one of those. Afghanistan was seen as one of those. And he said repeatedly on the campaign trail that he wanted to withdraw troops from the Middle East. Now, not all troops. But um, what you see um, as it translated into government in the 2018 U.S. National Defense Strategy was a shift from the so-called uh, global war on terror, the long war, um, where we've spent you know, 10, 10, 15, 18 years towards great power competition. This idea that while we were bogged down in the Middle East, um, Russia and China have been advancing. They've been moving out. They've been taking over their near neighbors. They've been co-opting them politically, economically, militarily. And we've missed that and our interests have suffered. So the Trump administration wants to, call, wants to cease involvement in these wars in the Middle East, which includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, and shift that effort into recapitalizing and modernizing the U.S. force to um, deter and prevent uh, uh, basically this sort of salami slicing, creeping uh, uh, gains made by Russia and China. Hmm. And that's kind of where we are. That's right. And uh, how do you see the strategies of the future administration in Afghanistan? Well, honestly, there's not a whole lot of difference. I mean, when you look, you know, it's really remarkable. You go from George W. Bush to Barack Obama to um, uh, Donald Trump. And if you look at the individual policies in Afghanistan up until a week ago, you could not tell a difference. You can't tell the policies apart, even though um, mm. the ideological focuses are, are drastically different. So what that indicates to me when you, when you see the lack of I ideology is that this is a problem that's difficult to solve, that you're using engineering solutions rather than policy-based solutions. And we see the same thing with narcotics policy. We see the same thing with public housing policy. Um, you know, the, the portfolio can shift from the far left to the far right, and there won't be a difference in policy. And that means that it's a very difficult problem. Um, so where are we in Afghanistan? Well, there's a couple of things. The first thing is, um, uh, it's obvious that whatever price the United States has paid in Afghanistan is too high for the value that we've gotten. Um, after 18 years of involvement, it's clear that the Afghan security forces are not capable of maintaining security in their own country on their own. It's clear that um, we've had to make compromises with Afghanistan, with Pakistan, with the Central Asian republics to the north for the sake of the, the war in Afghanistan that we're not really comfortable with. 
Um, uh, and it's, it's also clear that uh, uh, our involvement, uh, while there have been some benefits in things like women's rights in Afghanistan and stuff like that, um, we've also been spreading a lot of money around that allows not only in Afghanistan, but in Afghan's neighboring states, it perpetuates a, a dysfunctional culture of corruption. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that, you know, our involvement there has been a financial engine of, you know, that allows corrupt regimes that don't have respect for human rights, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but in the neighboring states to strengthen themselves. So um, it's a mixed legacy. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you ask uh, the average American or even American strategists, you know, what's the benefit of staying in Afghanistan? They can't give you a positive benefit. What they do is the narrative instantly shifts to bad things that will happen when we leave. So into this comes Donald Trump, who doesn't care for convention, doesn't care for political or diplomatic convention, sees himself as the ultimate problem solver. So, you know, he's kind of, you know, said, I'm not going to play this game, (laughs) throwing the, throwing the table over and uh, announced a rapid drawdown. And it'll be interesting to see where we go from there. Yeah. I guess uh, Donald Trump was a person who ruled the uh, world because America is the world's leading power. Who ruled the world through t- Twitter? Uh, who, who ruled the world what? I'm sorry? Through t- Twitter. Oh, through Twitter. Yes. Well, you know, there there was a story uh, in one of our newspapers last week that said that the American negotiators at the Doha conference with the Taliban referred to being under the tweet of Damocles. Um, So, you know, there's a famous, you know, the sword of Damocles that hangs, you know, and they said this is the tweet of Damocles. And I tell you, that is a very, very um, it's forward looking. I think it's the way the world is going, but it's not how diplomacy is traditionally conducted. Um, The people who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 were unhappy with the way things had happened. They wanted something new. They certainly got it. And sometimes it's good. I mean, as a junior government official, when I was mm-hmm. engaged in negotiations, you know, say at GHQ and Raul Pindi, you know, when we were talking about some issue, uh, mm-hmm. you'd get as far as you could on solving the problem. And then if there was something you couldn't solve, you know, and you typically, um, you know, like a country like U.S. and Pakistan on defense issues, our relations, our, our concerns are very similar. So typically we'd get to about 80 percent on ourselves. And for the other 20 percent, we say, well, we'll have to elevate this, you know, and mm-hmm. discuss it at joint staff talks with the secretary. Well, if your president is Donald Trump, you know, and, and you know, when you try to solve intractable problems, you say we elevate it. Hmm. Um, normally with the Secretary of Defense, you know, in past administrations, when you elevate an issue, then you just deal with the 10 percent that you elevated. Hmm. If I were engaged in negotiations, uh, hmm. you know, and Donald Trump was president, I'd say, OK, here's the deal, guys. We're 80 or 90 percent of the way there. We can either, you know, come to an agreement on this remaining 10 percent or. I can elevate it and who knows what'll happen, you know, <laughs> who knows what'll happen. You know, you yeah. could wind up with nothing. We could be back at zero. That yeah. actually, paradoxically, that would empower me as a junior government official mm. in negotiations. Mm. So, mm. Um, you know, it's it, the, the, if, if all you do is read the New York Times and the Washington Post, you'd think that um, this unorthodox approach that Trump's had is a universal bad. But, uh, mm. you know, I'm an inherently optimistic person. And uh, I, I, uh, I think that, you know, there is some advantage uh, to having that from time to time. The key is you don't want unorthodoxy as your way of doing business. That, that just quickly descends into chaos. Hmm. That's right. That's very great. And what about Iran, Dave? Yeah, Iran's an animating consideration. Um, so I think when, um, when President Trump's friends assess his administration, uh, the, the Iran will be one of the weak spots. Um, so when he went into office, he said, look, the Iran deal that the Biden administration compl- or that the uh, Obama administration had completed was the worst deal in the history of the world. And his whole um, persona was that he was the master deal maker, that he understood negotiations, he understood deals, he knew how to do it. He was going to make a better deal. And he was going to make a better deal with the Koreans and he's going to North Koreans. He was going to make a better deal with Iran. And honestly, he hasn't had any success on either one of those fronts. So those are the two big setbacks. And um, it's very important for him to maintain the narrative that he's the guy who makes the deals you know, successfully. So what has he done? Well, he's engaged in this policy called maximum pressure designed to you know, force the Iranians to come to a deal. Um, 
Of course, the problem is Iran is a very corrupt country that is ruled by an authoritarian dictatorship that is enabled by a self-interested, ideologically driven, but thoroughly corrupt organization in the Revolutionary Guards. So if you impose sanctions on a country that's ruled by a corrupt person, the overall economic pie gets smaller, but the mm. corrupt organization that controls it gets a larger piece of that pie. This, uh -huh. this analogy may not be unfamiliar to those of you who've lived in Pakistan for a couple of decades. Yeah. So, so the paradoxically, the absolute power of the Revolutionary Guard in Iran has increased. And they know they're dealing with a democracy where, mm. you know, Trump could be voted out in four years as he has. So, mm. you know, I, I think that by any objective, you know, has he succeeded in curtailing um, Iran's overseas presence, its ambition? Well, to a certain extent, he has. The overall rate of attacks has declined in part because, you know, the Iranian leadership has had to choose between, you know, spending money to keep the lights on Tehran or to fund Hezbollah. Uh, and what mm -hmm. we're seeing is that, you know, in places like Lebanon and Iraq, where you, the Iranian government has the ability to disrupt government, it's actually now being challenged. It actually has to participate in governing. It has to help rebuild Lebanon and Syria. And it's unable to do that. But that's still not a success. And, uh, you know, our European partners who were very vested in the Iran deal, uh, they are angry at us. They're, they're all happy to see the back of Trump. Um, so, you know, and, Tr and Iran has enhanced its nuclear stockpile. So mm -hmm. it's it's not a record of success. And I think it's something that he's desperately trying to ameliorate as he goes out the door. And what is the future? Again, the Obama policy will take place in Joe Biden's time. Well, so what Biden has said is that he'll reenter the deal. But the problem is, you know, a deal requires two parties. And mm -hmm. by saying I'm going to reenter the deal, what he's done is surrender all the leverage to the Iranian side. So. Yeah. Um, you know, the situation is not the same as it was in 2016. And uh, I think when when Biden was campaigning and saying, I'm going to reenter the deal, he was assuming that there would, you know, the polls in America were saying, were showing that not only would he be elected president in a landslide, and he's been elected president in a fairly close election, not a landslide, but also that he would have the Senate and the House of Representatives would be behind him in his party. And as it turns out, the House of Representatives, his minority has shrunk. And in the Senate, he either will not control the Senate or he'll have a very, very small, like a one senator advantage. Mm. And two Democratic senators, the leader of the Democratic Party in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, and the leader of the Democratic Party on Foreign Affairs, Bob Menendez, have both opposed the Iran deal. So he does not have a majority for that issue in the Senate. Oh. So, so he can't do anything controversial. He can't get a treaty ratified. Um, if I were the Iranians, I would say, okay, you want to go back to the 2016 deal? Every sanction imposed since 2016 has to go away. And that means he's going to have to lift sanctions on Hezbollah, on uh, people who have illegally imprisoned and tortured dissidents, people who have shot dissidents, people who have developed missiles. Um, politically, that can't happen. The Iranians may ask for compensation for the economic damage they suffered. There is no way that a president with at best a one senator majority majority in a time in which he's going to have to impose austerity on American domestic scene is going to agree to give US tax dollars to Iran. So it's it's not clear. It's the, same. It's the yeah. same. Well, there will be a change in tone. There will be a change in tone. So instead yeah. of the, um, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo, who is a who mm -hmm. I've known for 35 years, who's a very smart guy, who mm -hmm. is um, honestly um, a very um, open fellow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he said, these are the 13 conditions you have to meet. Mm -hmm. the, the Iranians dismissed that out of hand, as any sovereign nation would. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, but there will be, so there will be a change in tone saying, hey, let's talk about this, let's sit down. But I think that what you'll see is that, um, you have to have both. You have to have negotiations and you have to have pressure. And, uh, you know, I think that the Iranian regime will will either demand a, a reduction of pressure in exchange for negotiations that then puts the pressure on the Biden administration to conclude negotiations. 
or uh, they'll just continue in this standoff until there's some sort of Iranian concession. And uh, neither one of those are likely to lead to, you know, this return to the good feelings of 2016. That's right. Deep, I, I would like to ask you, what about our love and hate relation? Uh, Pakistan, Pakistan and the United, United States? Yeah. Well, so I got to tell you, um, the future is not bright for Pakistan if um, the American relations, if there is a drawdown in Iran. Um, as a nation, um, Pakistan suffers. Pakistan's image suffers in the United States because it's always viewed as an adjunct to something. It's either mm -hmm. viewed as, you know, India generally, going back to the 1960s, um, you know, John Kenneth Galbraith is U.S. ambassador to India in the Kennedy administration. India gets a positive vibe in the United States uh, because most Indians who come here are very, they view themselves as ambassadors of India. They're very proud of it. They always say the world's largest democracy. It's seen as a, a country with great potential. Um, the fact that that potential has not been realized since the 1960s, um, mm. that's kind of overlooked. But every Indian in America views themselves as an ambassador in India. Mm. Pakistan, on the contrast, um, most Americans, you know, most people in America who are from Pakistan view themselves as refugees or dissidents from Pakistan. Um, okay. You know, it's it's unfortunate. So the people who know most about the country in the United States do not speak positively of the country. And they speak of Pakistan the way the Pakistanis speak of Pakistan, which is it's a country that has a deep state. It's a country where government is never quite there. It's a country that is, uh, you know, has breathtaking levels of corruption or inefficiency uh, that fails to provide basic services to its citizens. Um, and, you know, that, uh, 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 you know, that, that people in India uh, who get rich in India tend to invest in India. People who get rich in Pakistan tend to invest in London and the United States. So there's this growing sense that the elite who prosper in India or in Pakistan, rather, are divorced from Pakistan. So that's bad. The second problem is, as I said, Pakistan is seen either as an adjunct to India or as an adjunct to Pakistan. It's never dealt with. It's very rarely dealt with in its own issue. Um, so that's a problem in the State Department. The bureau that deals with Pakistan um, is the bureau at the assistant secretary level is the bureau that also deals with India in the defense mm -hmm. department, the bureau that deals with, um, uh, Af uh, Pakistan at the deputy assistant secretary level deals with Afghanistan and the central Asian states of the former Soviet Republic. And, you know, so, so the country that deals with India is in a separate office. So there's never a coherent policy there. And finally, um, you know, you look at where Pakistan was with regards to the United States prior to 9-11. It was on the outside. And, uh, you know, the issues that we were looking at were human rights, narcotics, although Pakistan has made incredible progress in countering narcotics, um, democratization, and, of course, a nuclear program. That all shifts with 9-11 because, quite frankly, Pakistan becomes a necessary partner in the global war on terror. Um, once the United States downscales its presence in Afghanistan, then we look at Pakistan, what do we see? Uh, right now, a, a democratic government, thank goodness, but we see you know, problems with human rights, problems with education, problems with corruption, all things that are characteristic of, not of a NATO country, but of like a minor country in Latin America. Um, so you know, it's gonna require a lot of sustained outreach and involvement for Pakistan to reach its potential, for the American-Pakistani relationship to reach its potential. And at the same time, of course, Pakistan is a major, is, is this too long an answer for you or? No, no, no. It's okay, okay. The well, at the, okay, at the same time, Pakistan is a major target of Chinese influence. And, yeah. uh, you know, in the United States, if a company bribes the foreign officials overseas, he can be prosecuted in American courts. Uh, in Pakistan, <laughs> or I'm sorry, in, in China, you know, he'll probably be promoted. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of, of Chinese development, which quite frankly, I think is, is not being conducted in Pakistan's best interest, but it's being done quickly, you know, because, um, you know, some of the local conditions that Americans find, you know, won't work with or can't work with 
depending on whether you think we act out of good nature or out of fear, um, those are not barriers for China. Um, mm -hmm. So, so um, it's going to be very hard. The natural line of drift is towards this, you know, Chinese with the open hand who want to build a railroad that goes all the way to Gwadar, um, you know, and basically annex that area, make it a, a de facto colony. And in the United States, it'll be standoffish and say, hey, you know, not sure if uh, the, you know, recent elections in Karachi were held appropriately. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. There's just not a natural community of um, a natural community of interest uh, towards Pakistan in the United States. And Dave, I, I like to ask you one thing that we always uh, listen to many debates and many arguments from our American friends. People like you always advocate about human rights, mm -hmm. democracy, women yeah. rights. And there are so many rights you are, you yeah. people always push us for. But why don't you like raise these voices in Gulf countries? No democracy Good question. needed there. No human rights needed there. Yeah. No human yeah. rights needed there. Uh, mm -hmm. No basic democracy needed there. Like, yeah. Yeah. The, the, that prison is exempted just because of oil money? Or... Well, that's a, it's, it's a good question. And I can tell you, um, I, I would urge you to just Google the State Department Human Rights Reports, and you'll find out that that is a remarkably objective. I mean, not only do the Gulf countries come in for a lot of crap, France does uh, for its uh, laicite laws. You know, the, the uh, you know, and I tell this to people who haven't read the report, they're amazed. The United States government criticizes France for not allowing Muslims to wear head dressings in civic offices. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in an official U.S. document. So we are even handed on it. But to be honest, um, uh, it's, it's rather similar. Uh, we have a hierarchy. If you look at our national defense strategies, you know, prom promoting democracy and human rights have always been one of our uh, issues that we've looked at, um, that we've put forward in our national defense strategy going back to the 70s, going back to the 70s. The problem is in areas where we also have a security concern, and so that includes um, uh, the Gulf countries, uh, you know, we... Um, the security concerns in those areas tends to elevate it. If the security concern, uh, you know, isn't there, which perhaps will be the case if if there's a hypothetical U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, then you'll find in countries, the Central Asian states, Pakistan, um, that the human rights concern rises in importance. Prior to 9-11, the big military issue between the United States and Saudi Arabia was the fact that uh, we had an Air Force pilot who was a woman who was flying missions over Iraq in Saudi Arabia. And then when she landed, she wasn't allowed to drive a car. <laughs> and she raised that to members of Congress. And that was that was a big kerfuffle. Then 9-11 happened. The security interests arose again. Now, from the outside, people look at this and say, this is hypocrisy. You know, you cited the economic things. It's actually more of a it's actually more of a um, uh, security uh, rather than the economy. Uh, but that looks like hypocrisy and and i get that i realize that it, it it is that but you know when you look at a superpower a country that has global interests and that has many interests that is expected to enforce human rights you know when the rwanda genocide happened in 1994 uh nobody called for canada to solve that you know the united nations force had already been defeated uh the united states had to go in and solve that after the the death of the 10 un peacekeepers um so Basically, a superpower, uh, hypocrisy is a synonym for democracy for a superpower because we uh -huh. have to engage on the security issue, narcotics issue, human rights. We have to engage on all those things, and, and we do it simultaneously. Uh, so, so honestly, to look at it and to call it hypocrisy really means that you don't understand the nature of a democracy or of a superpower. You know, if you're Iceland, then you mm. can say, we have a human rights-based policy towards Southeast Asia, you mm. know, because you don't have any security interests in Southeast Asia. But right. but for a, for a superpower, we have to, all of these are in a constant dynamic tension. And I can tell you, uh, within the U.S. government, uh, there are food fights all the time between 
you know, human rights and all that. I mean, I, I, uh, there's a, the current, there's a congressman from New Jersey who is, uh, uh, he was the assistant secretary of defense for human rights and he raked me over the coals in the Pentagon, you know, and, and, uh, gave me quite an education. You know, I mean, he taught me a few things I didn't know, but he also told me I was a bad person <laughs> because I was, um, promoting, uh, uh, I was advancing security concerns in one of these Gulf states you're talking about at, in his mind, the, the expense of human rights. And I can tell you, if he saw me again today, he would tell me now from a position as a member of Congress, exactly how wrong I was. <laughs> and I would have to stand there and say, yes, sir. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what about the Pakistan and India conflicts in the yeah. region and Kashmir? Kashmir is very sensitive issue in Pakistan. It is, it is like everyone's issue in Pakistan. And I, I believe so same the case with India. How you see it, how you see the conflict to be resolved? What what is your let's say I ask you for your suggestions? Do you want to hear my view or do you want to hear an American view? Both. Okay, well let me start off with the American view. Yeah. So the the average American thinks that everybody from Morocco to Bangladesh is an Arab, okay? Oh. And, uh, uh, you know, there really is, is not much interest in this. And um, Indians and Pakistanis are considered to be the same people. And the Indian-Pakistani conflict is almost inexplicable to any American unless they sit down and read, you know, a, a long book like Freedom at Midnight. Um, uh, the, the result, I think, is is best. Um, we see it as as a an absolutely pointless conflict between two groups of people who are identical culturally, linguistically, and over. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Pervez Musharraf had a hard time speaking Urdu. You know, <laughs> I mean, he, he, you know, I mean, I mean, that's that's just ridiculous. So. Um, uh, uh, we we had a uh, there there was a famous cartoon about twenty years ago um, that that showed a military it was supposed to show a South Asian military parade and I, honestly I don't know whether it was India or Pakistan but it, it basically had an ox cart you know an ox pulling a cart that had a missile mm. on it and that's ah. how you know with all the developmental problems you know the the fact that you have two nuclear powers who cannot have twenty four hour electricity and running water in their national capitals, although you can do it in Islamabad, you know, because it's, you know, an artificial city. I mean, it's not, you know, that is just breathtaking. That is just breathtaking. So we see that as inexplicable. Now, the average American doesn't know anything about Kashmir except that it was a Led Zeppelin song. They may have heard stories about it from, from that. Now, now, let me give you my impression, okay? So, you know, I, I did not study, I've never studied a, a Central Asian and South Asian language. Uh, you know, I studied Arabic. Um, uh, uh, when I uh, when I went to uh, uh, Afghanistan, I put a little time into uh, 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 Pashto, but I yeah. took Pashto. <laughs> I took Pakistani dialect. So that was a wash. That was a mistake. <laughs> uh, everywhere I went in Afghanistan, people people were like. That guy is the uh, palest ISI agent I've ever seen in my life. Um, uh, the um, uh, uh, when I went to graduate school, you know, to study Arabic in London, I knew that there are some areas that are contentious. You know, so I knew, for example, Morocco and Algeria don't get along, and of course, the big, the mother of all conflicts was Israel-Palestine. Hmm. Um, when I got to London, which, as you know, has a vibrant South Asian community. I mean, geez, you know, the head of the MQM lived in London. For yeah. Um, uh, Our ex prime minister is living right now. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes, he does. Yeah. Yeah. He's either in London or Dubai. Um, and, of course, uh, your current prime minister, when I lived in London, he lived in London. Um, yeah. the, the greatest political conflict and strife over an external issue i thought would be israel palestine it was not it was kashmir it was kashmir it was india pakistan and by and large you know occasionally people argue over sir creek or whatever that can be resolved but it was kashmir 
And what I've learned about that is, first off, I probably will not live long enough to understand all the details. Um, I'm sure there has to be a solution just because the um, neither country can afford this, you know, to maintain standing troops at 26,000 feet when, you know, India is seeing the Chinese moving their border across. And you are seeing large parts of your country becoming, in effect, Chinese. Um, it, it is it is ridiculous. You have bigger fish to fry. I don't know what the solution is. I know that the longer the conflict goes on, the more grievance there is. I know that it's very hard to have a solution out of grievance. The, um, the best definition, the legal definition of, of a compromise is a solution in which both parties think they lost. <laughs> I think that's what's, you know, normally we like to speak of a win-win, yeah. but I think if, if Kashmir is resolved, it will be a lose-lose. But this idea, I think for, for over 50 years, both sides have tried to convince the rest of the world that they are right and the other side is wrong. That hasn't gotten anywhere. And uh, I think that, um, you know, the conditions on the Indian side for settling it are worse now than they would have been 10 years ago. But sometimes... Um, you know, it's darkest before the dawn. So mm -hmm. I don't have anything other than a indeterminate, you know, than my innate optimism and hope. I don't have anything mm -hmm. to offer. And I don't really have any technical expertise except to say the outside world isn't going to intervene and solve this. It's too complicated, too hard, too muddy, too difficult. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, it's going to have to be solved between people who quite frankly, from a Western perspective are nearly identical in outlook and culture. Um, you know, so, and, and the problems you face. So why not solve it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not I, a satisfactory I, answer, I'm afraid. I completely agree with you that we have to solve it. We have to, ultimately, we have to solve it. We don't have drinking water in both the yeah. countries for our kids. Yeah. We don't have, we have environmental issues. We have economic, economic challenges. The economy is yeah. suffering on both ends. We have spending a hell lot of money on fighting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Peace doesn't need a single penny. Yep. Yep. It gives yeah. you a lot of wealth back. Peace gives you a lot of wealth back. Yeah. And the other problem is, you know, eternal conflict is like an incubator for, um, for corruption and authoritarianism. You know, unfortunately, um, this is, I mean, you're a man of faith. Uh, I, I'm a man of faith, not, not in your league, but, um, I, I generally believe human nature is good. Human nature is perfectible, but I also realize that there are some conditions that bring out the worst in human nature conflict, uh, even a, among a free people in a democratic state, when there's a period of conflict, they acquiesce in seeing their rights subsumed and they demand less of their government. They demand less of the people who are in positions of government. And so if you are in a position of authority, um, you know, and you want to just keep people angry or you want to take money out of this or you want to build up elements that are responsive, you know, elements of the state that are responsive to you and not responsive to um, the needs of your people like drinking water in major cities, then you become a stakeholder in perpetuating conflict. Now note, I haven't pinned that on one state. <laughs> Because I think it, I think it on both sides of the line of control. I think, yeah, you know, there's a lot of dysfunctionality. So at some point, the stakeholders in conflict have to be disenfranchised by the stakeholders in resolution. Uh, unfortunately, that may be a, a generational process, um, and you know, but I mean. You know, I, I have an unusual name in, in America. My parents are Canadian immigrants. Um, uh, and, you know, my father comes from the French speaking part of Canada and my mother comes from the English speaking part of Canada. And, uh, you know, in, in the 1830s, you know, that was an insurrection and such an arrangement was impossible to think of unless one side captured the other. So now people look at me and they say, you know, you know, you, can, you can't tell what I am by looking at me. Um, uh, so, you know, hopefully and, and, and the same is true, you know with India and, and Pakistan, I, the, the potential, if there is peace, is so great, is yeah. so great, is so great. And the conflict destabilizes both countries inside of themselves, yeah. so. True, true. Yeah. Yeah. And Dave, let's, because we are discussing very hot topics of our region, 
<laughs> oh, oh no, well, we've done it. We've done cashmere. That's the easy one. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on to Israel. That's the yeah. hard one. Uh, there is a development in the region that deals with Israel, UAE, mm -hmm. yeah. Mary, Muscat, and now I guess KSA is joining the club very soon. Bahrain was like a pilot phase of uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia when it enters in the club. So we thought that, okay, this is pilot project and now KSA is. So mm -hmm. How do you see the future of the re uh, region with peace deals with Israel, one? And second, as a Pakistani, uh, we are listening that there is a huge pressure on our uh, political leadership to have normal relations with Israel. Is this pressure from USA? One. Yeah. Well, l let me start from the back. Your questions work forward. I think when you look at things that the USA has wants out of Pakistan, um, uh, recognizing Israel, I think, would be pretty far down the list. Um, I'm, I, we would welcome it. I'm sure that we ask about it. I'm sure that we are raising the issue there. But uh, there's a hierarchy of things that we, we would like to see Pakistan do, all of which we think will benefit Pakistan, by the way. We, we very rarely uh, – one, one thing that a lot of people don't realize for the United States is usually when it – we could be right, we could be wrong, but usually when we tell a country you need to do something, um, we usually do it. We do that because we think it's in their best interest, as mm. well as ours. Uh, mm. On the rare occasions when we ask a country to do something that we think is not in their interest but is in our interest, we're usually upfront about that. We say, "This is going to be hard for you. We would like you to do this for us." <laughs> um, mm. uh, and and I know that for those who haven't served in government, they see it as the United States says. You got to do this because we're big and you're small, but honestly, um, that's that's not the way it is. Um, uh, that, that's just not the way it is. Uh, so, um, when you look at when you look at what's going on with Israel right now, the question is: Are the recognitions by Bahrain and by the UAE are they lasting fundamental changes or are they transactional? Um, are they uh, you know uh, basically a bet? Uh, made in to in the dying, you know, in in what could be in the election run up to what could be a second Trump term to occupy the place of honor among Arab partners of a new Trump administration, mm -hmm. or are they a recognition that we've tried everything for fifty years, it hasn't worked, and as I said earlier about empowering people of cooperation, that perhaps the Palestinian leadership um, has become stakeholders, you know, the individual leaders have become stakeholders in perpetuating the conflict rather than resolving it, that they're, you know, a, a, another corrupt organization. Um, and, and a blank assessment that, you know, the conditions that would be just for the Palestinian people are just unattainable. And that, you know, there are, are um, you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of people in Karachi whose families lived in India. And there are a lot of people, you know, in, you um, Rajasthan, whose families lived in Peshawar, and they're just not going back. And, uh, you know, maybe Israel, Palestine's the same way. Um, honestly, we don't know. It's too early. What will be interesting is to see how long this lasts. Now, you mentioned Oman. Oman has not normalized relations with Israel, but Netanyahu visited Muscat and, you know, met with the Sultan of Oman and, you know, was photographed without recognizing it. So there is some pragmatic, a pragmatic stream there. You know, the Sultan of Oman is widely considered to be one of the smartest guys, was one of the smartest guys in the Middle East. Um, the eternal conflict, you know, the conflict has dragged on for over 50 years. It hasn't gotten the Palestinians much. It hasn't gotten Israel much. And uh, it has provided um, a... Uh, uh, an excuse for Israel's worst enemies, Iran, Hezbollah, to perpetuate this conflict, to expand it. If it could be resolved, it would be, it would enhance the security of all the countries in the region. Um, the problem is, it appeared as though the Trump administration's policy was to say, well, we just haven't put enough pressure on these guys. So they have taken a number of steps that 
I don't think anybody in the Washington policy community recommended starting with moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, uh, you know, it seems like they're recognizing uh, aspects of the uh, annexation of the West Bank, uh, uh, recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Uh, these are all bold issues. Um, I don't think they're recommended, but I got to tell you, you know, all the smart people said, you know, if you move the embassy to Jerusalem, you know, then your city will erupt in flames. And, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere from Morocco to the Philippines, you know, you know, every Coca-Cola bottling plant will be burned down. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, what we've got here is a very tender, small shoot that has just emerged from the ground. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll see how the Biden administration handles it. And it could turn to be something that just dies, that it was just transactional, that it was just, went, or it could be something that grows. We don't know. But again, um, uh, what we've done in the past hasn't worked. Mm. Um, I think that a Biden administration will put less faith in this idea that somehow the Palestinians can be beaten down into making concessions. And I think that they will demand other things. And I think that we will see the emergence of um, more uh, settl settlers, settlements as an issue. But, you know, Biden has always been rather stro strongly pro-Israel as well. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. And um, in the last, because I, I told you that uh, talking to you is such a beautiful learning event for me. I would <laughs> like to discuss the whole bunch of topics and we can talk like the whole night here and day on your side. But I, I will uh, ask you to uh, comment about uh, Libya, Iraq, mm -hmm. and Syria. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let me start with Syria. Um, I was a Malone fellow at the University of Aleppo. And I got to tell you, um, uh, if you go in the Middle East, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, east of Athens, my favorite cities in order are um, uh, Istanbul, mm -hmm. Peshawar, mm -hmm. uh Aleppo and then Damascus and mm. uh, Aleppo does not exist anymore. It does mm. not exist anymore. Um, Bashar al-Assad, who I'm sorry to say is also a graduate of London university. Um, you know, he just said either I rule or I destroy the country and he is destroying the country and he has sold his soul to uh, the Iranians primarily, although secondarily to the Russians. Uh, what he will find is that the Russians have realized, I think that they, um, have won a hollow crown, an empty crown, because they've managed to keep an ally uh, in power, but at such a financial cost that they will never be able to recover. So basically, they've they've thrown money. Basically, what they've what they've had is their Afghan war only without the death toll. The death toll has been smaller, but it's just been a huge gaining pit. Iran, on the other hand, has seen itself establish a proxy state. Uh, that allows them to complete a land route from Iran through Iraq to Hezbollah, where their, their other proxy state within a state exists. So it's a victory for Iran, and they've done it at a relatively low cost because the Russians have had to provide all the financial support. The Russians have provided the heavy equipment. All the Iranians have done is taken um, uh, various Shia militia, uh, some of whom are from your own country, and employ them there. And they don't care if they live or die, to be honest. It's been at a very low cost. Um, the United States has a confused response. Uh, Barack Obama um, found out that his own party did not support him taking military action against the use of chemical weapons. Um, uh, and so he kind of backed off. And basically until we saw Daesh rise, you know, people forget the first U.S. airstrikes in Syria were not against uh, Bashar al-Assad's forces. They were against Daesh. So we basically mm -hmm. left Syria to its own devices until we saw that the lack of governance there had created a safe haven for this, you know, brutal regime that was beheading aid workers and journalists, Americans. Um, so where are we going forward? Well, we're a victim of our own success. What we have is a de facto Kurdish state in northern Syria that are that was armed by us to defeat Daesh because we didn't have the foot soldiers, the desire to do it. Now that organization insists on a degree of autonomy, which would alienate Turkey. So 
you know, we can't really support them indefinitely, but we're kind of going to have to uh, because when Donald Trump tried, you know, told them we're withdrawing support for this, that was viewed as a betrayal and his secretary of defense resigned. And, and every member of Congress uh, in the Democratic Party said, how dare you betray our Turkish partners? So now for a Biden administration withdraw support, you know, and, and reestablish Syria, that's unacceptable. So that conflict is going to stay. And that's been a source of frustration with President Trump, who, you know, wanted a drawdown and didn't get it. Um, there's also a small American presence in southern Syria along the border with Jordan. That's going to have to stay, too, because that's seen as vital, vital to preserving Jordan's stability. So really, this is one of those wicked problems I spoke about at the start that are immune to ideology. We're kind of stuck there without an overall strategic plan, without an overall strategic guidance. We're in that position where we're trying to prevent bad things from happening. And quite frankly, we're going to be stuck in that position until we decide that bad things have already happened and we're not doing anything. We just withdraw. Um, your next question was Iraq. Iraq is in play. Um, Iran is, has um, uh, completely undermined and established a parallel government in Iraq that can deliver violence almost anywhere in the country at almost any purpose. Uh, there are elements of in Iraq who are paid by the Iraqi state of security forces who take orders from Tehran, <laughs> you know? So, so not only has Iran established a proxy army, they've got some other sucker to pay for it. Um, mm. Uh, the United States, on the other hand, is in a small position there trying to build federal forces who are continually undermined or outmaneuvered uh, by Iran. Um, I think that the worst case scenario for the United States is we withdraw from all of Iraq except for the Kurdish region in the north. We maintain a presence there to train federal forces and a counterterrorism presence because uh, ISIS arose as a result of misgovernment. Uh, the Shia majority in Iraq took over and said, we're in charge now. And the Sunni minority, which is used to running Iraq, said, um, you know, basically didn't necessarily like ISIS, but saw them as the only guys capable of moving the Shia out of Sunni areas. And uh, from an American perspective, we left them the country, we left them millions of dollars, we left them equipment, they squandered it all. And uh, then we had to come back in to deal with ISIS, which was the result of their own mismanagement. And now they want us to go again. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to hand the country over to the Iranians. If the U.S. embassy closes, as Trump threatens it will, it is possible that he may just say, okay, that's it. And every conceivable Iranian-supported or controlled militia in Iraq will be destroyed. Because once that embassy is gone, the American presence is in a few small defendable bases. So, um, you know, that, that, that's not a good thing. Uh, the bottom line is it's going to be a relationship in tension. Um, the United States is playing above board by the rules. Um, and then we have Iran that is supporting proxy forces, anonymous attacks, terrorist attacks, violence, threats of that, as well as legitimate popular uprisings. Uh, but it's important to know that while the Iranian-directed uh, factions are the most powerful in the Iraqi government, they are unable to deliver electricity, water, education, basic services. So, you know, Iran is good at destabilizing governments that have large Shia majorities. They are horrible at running these governments once they destabilize this. And the question is whether that accountability will reach it. Then the next question is Libya. Libya is another mess. Um, so in 2011, uh, a couple of things happened. First off, people thought that there was this sort of wind of change that was inexorable, that all these dictators were falling in the Arab Spring and, and that, you know, you either um, harness the wave of history or get crushed beneath it. Um, you know, and, and the same thing, you know, people forget, but your country became independent the same year that Israel did. And that was another wind of change. This is the first wave of decolonizations, Pakistan, India, uh, Israel, you know, this is the future. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, some of it was good. You know, Tunisia is a success story. Libya is not good. Um, from an American perspective, Libya is a European problem. Um, the, um, uh, the Europeans were the ones who were pushing for action. And they said, we're going to lead in Libya because we know you, the United States, are bearing the brunt of Afghanistan and the brunt of um, Iraq. So we want you to just support us with key 
uh, things like air to air refueling and overhead infrastructure. And we'll take care of this because quite frankly, the Europeans were more concerned that there'd be a mass migration, immigrants coming across, you know, people washing up on the shores of Sicily, dead bodies. So, um, uh, the United States said, okay, Europe, you've got it. We're going to the famous Obama phrase lead from behind. And what we saw within two weeks, the Europeans said, oh my gosh, this is more complicated than we thought. We're out mm -hmm. of munitions. You know, we can't do this. And the UN mandate, which was to, um, protect, prevent a massacre. You recall that mm -hmm. the cities in the East Benghazi rose it was to prevent a massacre there. That was mm -hmm. twisted by the Europeans with some American complicity into, a legal mandate for overthrowing Gaddafi, which I don't think was the intent of the mandate. I agree mm -hmm. with Vladimir Putin on this. Um, so what happened? Well, the country, uh, you know, settled into the same lines that it historically has been on, which ironically enough, the two provinces battling each other, those are the two provinces that were created when the emperor uh, Justinian divided the Roman em or, or Constantine rather divided the Roman empire. In millennia, yeah. um, Benghazi was the Eastern Empire and Tripoli was the Western Empire. Those provinces from time immemorial have always been kind of opposed to each other. And, you know, they were separate colonies under Italian mm. rule uh, and under Ottoman rule. They were separate yeah. provinces. Yeah. So um, you've got a problem there. Nobody um, sees it as a big enough problem to risk going in there and the, particularly the United States after the, after our embassy was overrun or after our consulate was overrun mm -hmm. and our ambassador was killed. Um, so nobody sees it. And, and quite frankly, people are just trying to keep a lid on it. And uh, the main European consideration there, I've got to tell you, is not resolving the conflict, not solving the world, though they'd like that to happen, but rather again, preventing a mass migration episode. Uh, and that reflects weaknesses in the European union. It reflects the divide between the southern members of the European Union, Italy and Greece, who are concerned about immigration, who think that they've borne the brunt of it unfairly, and the northern members who want to keep the European Union together, uh, but you know recognize the fragility of the Greek and Italian governments primarily. So it's one of those conflicts that's just going to stay on the slow boil. And quite frankly, we wouldn't talk about it so much. It would be like Congo. Six million people have died in the Congo. People don't talk about it because it's distant, but because Libya is right on the Mediterranean, uh, yeah. we pay a little bit more attention to it, but the dynamics are the same. I'm sorry to leave you with such a negative note, but that's yeah. my assessment. Yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful, Dave, for your time and your inputs. And I would love to have more and more sessions with you on different diverse topics. And that will be a great opportunity for me, personally for me, uh, learn uh, for my learnings, my understandings on different issues, because you have a very clear eye on uh, issues and lifelong experience too. Well, I'd, I'd love to do it, uh, preferably in Islamabad over a plate of green Bodhi chicken after a day of cricket practice. So uh, any, I would love any, to. Any. You are welcome. You are more than welcome, and I would love to have it. Thank you. But 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 I got to tell you, I'm a Christian, so I expect a bottle of Murray beer. I don't know how to get it, but uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it's it's not well known. But Pakistan has some of the best beer in the world. You have the best mangoes and the best beer, I think, or among the best beer. So, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor. Nice to talk to you. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.